4.3 around the world in 80 days. The novel is full of adventure and the excitement which the readers come across and enjoy from the beginning to the end. Feliz Fogg, the major character in the novel, accepts the challenge to go around the world in 80 days and in accomplishing this feat he goes through various lands and meets with diverse adventures. Thus the novel proceeds at a fast pace and there is always some excitement resulting from the various encounters. The beauty of the novel is that the writer takes the readers to a journey of many hair-raising incidents and exciting, adventurous, thrilling yet beautiful places in the world. The most important feature of this adventure novel is time. It illustrates repeatedly that time is fickle, and either works for or against them. In many cases, time follows their plans, when the delays build up and ships and trains leave without them that sometimes land the characters in trouble. In the end, Fogg wins the bet as he gained a day when crossing the international date line. The ultimate message is that no one can control time. Time will work the way it wants to work, and humans are at its mercy. Before his journey around the world, Fogg lived a solitary life. He closed himself off to others and cared little about the way he was perceived by other people. By the end of the trip, though, he recognizes the importance of human connections, both in the form of love, with order, and friendship and loyalty, with passapartout. Above all, this new understanding and appreciation is the greatest thing he has gained from this trip. Though he has the opportunity to double his fortune, Ford's motivation to embark on such a crazy adventure has little to do with the money. Instead, he wants to preserve his honor and prove his worth to the men of the Reform Club, to show that he can do what he sets out to do. Fogg spends nearly all of his money along the way, showing that riches are not what he is truly out for. For Phyllis Fogg, honor is more important than money. Throughout the entire trip, Fogg and his group encounter various obstacles standing in their way. These challenges allow them to use their quick thinking to come up with innovative solutions to even the most complicated of problems, relaying the message that no problem is unsolvable. It is not only Fogg who shows his clever wit in coming up with solutions. Passapart Out, too, shows his ingenuity in multiple situations. Plot Around the world in 80 days begins at the Reform Club in England with Felice Fogg, Thomas Flanagan, Samuel Follington, and John Sullivan sitting by a fireplace reading newspapers. We are introduced to Fogg, a very precise man who regularly goes to the Reform Club every evening. At the Reform Club, Fogg, Flanagan, Follington, and Sullivan are talking about a recent bank robbery. This conversation leads to a wager. Fogg is quite sure he can travel around the world in 80 days, while Sullivan doesn't believe it can be done. Sullivan, Flanagan, and Follington think Fogg is not considering the unexpected. All of the men accept the wager for £20,000. This is the beginning of the entire plot and from then on we see how Fogg goes around the world and we witness the amazing adventures that he has with his companions. The main plot is based on Fogg's travels, while other such plots merely support the central theme. Fix, the detective, follows. Fogg all over. He believes that Fogg is the bank robber who has robbed a great sum from the Bank of England. He puts obstacles in Fogg's path just so that he can arrest him whenever he gets the warrant from England. The suspicion that Fogg might be a clever gentleman robber is the sub-theme of the book and the author makes the reader also suspicious. Passapart out too wonders whether his master might be a robber though in his heart he has ample trust in Fogg's integrity. The plot moves ahead with Fogg striving through various obstacles to reach London in time. He goes through Brindisi, Suez, Bombay, now Mumbai, Calcutta, now Kolkata, Hong Kong, Yokohama, San Francisco, New York and finally Liverpool. Fix arrests Fogg at Liverpool and this delays Fogg a bit. He thinks that he has missed the deadline and hasn't reached London in time when in reality he reached a full day earlier. Thus Fogg wins the wager and in the course of his travels, finds himself a worthy charming, beautiful wife too. Synopsis of the Extract As soon as Fogg, Order and Passapart out arrive in Liverpool, Fix arrests Fogg. Feliz is thrown in jail. 
Several hours later, though, Fix learns that another man was responsible for the bank robbery, and he releases Fogg, who orders a special train. However, he arrives in London late, making everyone disappointed. Feliz and company are now broke, the deadline for the bet has passed, and there's nothing to do but go home and pout. Feliz locks himself in his room and, for the first time, allows himself to be seriously depressed. Order and Passapart out are so worried that they too can't eat or sleep. The following evening Fogg apologizes to Orda for being unable to provide for her comfort as a result of losing the bet. She in turn proposes marriage to him, and he joyfully agrees. Passapart out is sent to engage a clergyman, he runs off to get Reverend to marry Fogg and Orda the next day, which they all think is Monday. While running to grab the nearest preacher to marry Feliz and order, Passapart out finds out that it's actually Sunday, not Monday, like the group has been thinking. By traveling eastward around the world, Feliz Fogg, master calculator and obsessive organizer, has forgotten the time he's gained by journeying through all those time zones. He learns that their journey through the time zones had gained them a day and that they are not at all late. Passapart out races home, grabs Feliz by the collar, shoves him into a cab, and deposits him at the club. Feliz presents himself with minutes to spare and effectively wins the bet. He's rich once more, but more important as he says to himself he has won the heart of a charming woman. Around the World in 80 Days Chapter 34 In which Feliz Fogg at last reaches London Feliz Fogg was in prison. He had been shut up in the custom house, and he was to be transferred to London the next day. Passapart out, when he saw his master arrested, would have fallen upon Fix had he not been held back by some policemen. Orda was thunderstruck at the suddenness of an event which she could not understand. Passapart out explained to her how it was that the honest and courageous Fogg was arrested as a robber. The young woman's heart revolted against so heinous a charge, and when she saw that she could attempt to do nothing to save her protector, she wept bitterly. As for Fix, he had arrested Mr. Fogg because it was his duty, whether Mr. Fogg was guilty or not. The thought then struck Passapart out, that he was the cause of this new misfortune. Had he not concealed Fix's errand from his master? When Fix revealed his true character and purpose, why had he not told Mr. Fogg? If the latter had been warned, he would no doubt have given Fix proof of his innocence, and satisfied him of his mistake. At least, Fix would not have continued his journey at the expense and on the heels of his master, only to arrest him the moment he set foot. English Soil Passapart out wept till he was blind, and felt like blowing his brains out. Order and he had remained, despite the cold, under the portico of the custom house. Neither wished to leave the place. Both were anxious to see Mr. Fogg again. That gentleman was really ruined, and that at the moment when he was about to attain his end. This arrest was fatal. Having arrived at Liverpool at 20 minutes before 12 on the 21st of December, he had till a quarter before 9 that evening to reach the Reform Club, that is, 9 hours and a quarter. The journey from Liverpool to London was six hours. If anyone, at this moment, had entered the custom house, he would have found Mr. Fogg seated, motionless, calm, and without apparent anger, upon a wooden bench. He was not, it is true, resigned. But this last blow failed to force him into an outward betrayal of any emotion. Was he being devoured by one of those secret rages, all the more terrible because contained, and which only burst forth, with an irresistible force, at the last moment? No one could tell. There he sat, calmly waiting, for what? Did he still cherish hope? Did he still believe, now that the door of this prison was closed upon him, that he would succeed? However that may have been, Mr. Fogg carefully put his watch upon the table, and observed its advancing hands. Not a word escaped his lips, but his look was singularly set and stern. The situation, in any event, was a terrible one, and might be thus stated, if Feliz Fogg was honest he was ruined. If he was a knave, he was caught. Did escape occur to him? 
Did he examine to see if there was any practicable outlet from his prison? Did he think of escaping from it? Possibly. For once he walked slowly around the room. But the door was locked and the window heavily barred with iron rods. He sat down again and drew his journal from his pocket. On the line where these words were written, the 21st of December, Saturday, Liverpool, he added, 80th day, 11.40 a.m., and waited. The custom house clock struck one. Mr. Fogg observed that his watch was two hours too fast. Two hours. Admitting that he was at this moment taking an express train, he could reach London and the Reform Club by a quarter before 9 p.m. His forehead slightly wrinkled. At 33 minutes past two he heard a singular noise outside, then a hasty opening of doors. Passapatout's voice was audible, and immediately after that a fix. Feliz Forbes' eyes brightened for an instant. The door swung open, and he saw Passapart out, Oda, and Fix, who hurried towards him. Fix was out of breath, and his hair was in disorder. He could not speak. Sir, he stammered, Sir forgive me most unfortunate resemblance robber arrested three days ago you are free. Feliz Fogg was free. He walked to the detective, looked him steadily in the face, and with the only rapid motion he had ever made in his life, or which he ever would make, drew back his arms, and with the precision of a machine, knocked Fix down. Well hit, cried Passapart out, Pabulu. That's what you might call a good application of English fists. Fix, who found himself on the floor, did not utter a word. He had only received his desserts. Mr. Fogg, Oda, and Passapart out left the custom house without delay, got into a cab, and in a few moments descended at the station. Feliz Fogg asked if there was an express train about to leave for London. It was 40 minutes past two. The express train had left 35 minutes before. Feliz Fogg then ordered a special train. There were several rapid locomotives on hand. But the railway arrangements did not permit the special train to leave until 3 o'clock. At that hour Feliz Fogg, having stimulated the engineer by the offer of a generous reward, at last set out towards London with Oda and his faithful servant. It was necessary to make the journey in five hours and a half. And this would have been easy on a clear road throughout. But there were forced delays, and when Mr. Fogg stepped from the train at the terminus, all the clocks in London were striking ten minutes before nine. Having made the tour of the world, he was behind hand five minutes. He had lost the wager. Chapter 35 in which Felice Fogg does not have to repeat his orders to pass a putt out twice. The dwellers in Savile Row would have been surprised the next day if they had been told that Felice Fogg had returned home. His doors and windows were still closed, no appearance of change was visible. After leaving the station, Mr. Fogg gave Passapart out instructions to purchase some provisions and quietly went to his domicile. He bore his misfortune with his habitual tranquility, ruined, and by the blundering of the detective. After having steadily traversed that long journey, overcome a hundred obstacles, braved many dangers and still found time to do some good on his way, to fail near the goal by a sudden event which he could not have foreseen, and against which he was unarmed. It was terrible. But a few pounds were left of the large sum he had carried with him. There only remained of his fortune the twenty thousand pounds deposited at Bearings, and this amount he owed to his friends of the Reform Club. So great had been the expense of his tour that, even had he won, it would not have enriched him. And it is probable that he had not sought to enrich himself, being a man who rather laid wages for honour's sake than for the stake proposed. But this wager totally ruined him. Mr. Fogg's course, however, was fully decided upon. He knew what remained for him to do. A room in the house in Savile Row was set apart for Oda, who was overwhelmed with grief at her protector's misfortune. From the words which Mr. Fogg dropped, she saw that he was meditating some serious project. Knowing that Englishmen governed by a fixed idea sometimes resort to the desperate expedient of suicide. Passapartout kept a narrow watch upon his master, though he carefully concealed the appearance of so doing. 
he had found a bill from the gas company. First of all, the worthy fellow had gone up to his room and had extinguished the gas burner, which had been burning for 80 days. He had found in the letterbox a bill from the gas company, and he thought it more than time to put a stop to the sixpence, which he had been doomed to bear. The night passed. Mr. Fogg went to bed, but did he sleep? Oda did not once close her eyes. Passapatout watched all night, like a faithful dog, at his master's door. Mr. Fogg called him in the morning, and told him to get Oda's breakfast, and a cup of tea and a chop for himself. He desired Oda to excuse him from breakfast and dinner, as his time would be absorbed all day in putting his affairs to rights. In the evening he would ask permission to have a few moments conversation with the young lady. Passapatout, having received his orders, had nothing to do but obey them. He looked at his imperturbable master, and could scarcely bring his mind to leave him. His heart was full, and his conscience tortured by remorse. For he accused himself more bitterly than ever of being the cause of the irretrievable disaster. Yes. If he had warned Mr. Fogg, and had betrayed Fix's projects to him, his master would certainly not have given the detective passage to Liverpool, and then. Passapatout could hold in no longer. My master. Mr. Fogg. He cried. Why do you not curse me? It was my fault that I blame no one, returned Phyllis Fogg, with perfect calmness. I blame no one, returned Phyllis Fogg, with perfect calmness. Go. Passapatout left the room and went to find Oda, to whom he delivered his master's message. Madam, he added, I can do nothing myself, nothing. I have no influence over my master. But you, perhaps what influence could I have? Replied Oda. Mr. Fogg is influenced by no one. Has he ever understood that my gratitude to him is overflowing? Has he ever read my heart? My friend, he must not be left alone an instant. You say he is going to speak with me this evening? Yes, madam. Probably to arrange for your protection and comfort in England. We shall see, replied Oda, becoming suddenly pensive. Throughout this day, Sunday, the house in Savile Row was as if uninhabited, and Felice Fogg, for the first time since he had lived in that house, did not set out for his club when Westminster clock struck half past eleven. Why should he present himself at the reform? His friends no longer expected him there. As Felice Fogg had not appeared in the saloon on the evening before Saturday, the 21st of December, at a quarter before nine he had lost his wager. It was not even necessary that he should go to his bankers for the £20,000. For his antagonists already had his cheque in their hands, and they had only to fill it out and send it to the bearings to have the amount transferred to their credit. Mr. Fogg, therefore, had no reason for going out, and so he remained at home. He shut himself up in his room, and busied himself putting his affairs in order. Passapatout continually ascended and descended the stairs. The hours were long for him. He listened at his master's door, and looked through the keyhole, as if he had a perfect right so to do, and as if he feared that something terrible might happen at any moment. Sometimes he thought of Fix, but no longer in anger. Fix, like all the world, had been mistaken in Felice Fogg, and had only done his duty in tracking and arresting him. While he, passapat out. This thought haunted him, and he never ceased cursing his miserable folly. Finding himself too wretched to remain alone, he knocked at Oda's door, went into her room, seated himself, without speaking, in a corner, and looked ruefully at the young woman. Oda was still pensive. About half past seven in the evening Mr. Fogg sent to know if Oda would receive him, and in a few moments he found himself alone with her. Felice Fogg took a chair, and sat down near the fireplace, opposite Oda. No emotion was visible on his face. Fogg returned was exactly the Fogg who had gone away. There was the same calm, the same impassibility. He sat several minutes without speaking. Then, bending his eyes on Oda, Madam, said he, will you pardon me for bringing you to England? I. Mr. Fogg, replied Oda, checking the pulsations of her heart. 
Please let me finish, returned Mr. Fogg. When I decided to bring you far away from the country which was so unsafe for you, I was rich and counted on putting a portion of my fortune at your disposal. Then your existence would have been free and happy. But now I am ruined. I know it, Mr. Fogg, replied Oda. And I ask you in my turn, will you forgive me for having followed you, and who knows? For having, perhaps, delayed you, and thus contributed to your ruin. Madam, you could not remain in India, and your safety could only be assured by bringing you to such a distance that your persecutors could not take you. So, Mr. Fogg, resumed order, not content with rescuing me from a terrible death, you thought yourself bound to secure my comfort in a foreign land. Yes, madam. But circumstances have been against me. Still, I beg to place the little I have left at your service. But what will become of you, Mr. Fogg? As for me, madam, replied the gentleman coldly, I have need of nothing. But how do you look upon the fate, sir, which awaits you? As I am in the habit of doing. At least, said Orda, one should not overtake a man like you. Your friends, I have no friends, madam. Your relatives, I have no longer any relatives. I pity you, then, Mr. Fogg, for solitude is a sad thing, with no heart to which to confide your griefs. They say, though, misery itself, shared by two sympathetic souls, may be borne with patience. They say so, madam. Mr. Fogg, said Orda, rising and seizing his hand, do you wish at once a kinswoman and friend? Will you have me for your wife? Mr. Fogg, at this, rose in his turn. There was an unwanted light in his eyes, and a slight trembling of his lips. Orda looked into his face. The sincerity, rectitude, firmness, and sweetness of the soft glance of a noble woman, who could dare all to save him to whom she owed all, at first astonished, then penetrated him. He shut his eyes for an instant, as if to avoid her look. When he opened them again, I love you. He said, simply. Yes, by all that is holiest, I love you, and I am entirely yours. Ah! cried Oda, pressing his hand to her heart. Passapartout was summoned and appeared immediately. Mr. Fox still held Oda's hand in his own. Passapartout understood, and his big, round face became as radiant as the tropical sun at its zenith. Mr. Fogg asked him if it was not too late to notify the Reverend Samuel Wilson, of Malabon Parish, that evening. Passapartout smiled his most genial smile, and said, never too late. It was five minutes past eight. Will it be for tomorrow, Monday? For tomorrow, Monday, said Mr. Fogg, turning to Oda. Yes. For tomorrow, Monday, she replied. Passapartout hurried off as fast as his legs could carry him. Chapter 36 in which Phyllis Fogg's name is once more at a premium on change. It is time to relate what a change took place in English public opinion when it transpired that the real bank robber, a certain James Strand, had been arrested on the 17th day of December at Edinburgh. Three days before, Phyllis Fogg had been a criminal, who was being desperately followed up by the police. Now he was an honourable gentleman, mathematically pursuing his eccentric journey round the world. The papers resumed their discussion about the wager. All those who had laid bets, for or against him, revived their interest, as if by magic. The Phyllis Fogg bonds again became negotiable, and many new wages were made. Felice Fogg's name was once more at a premium on change. His five friends of the Reform Club passed these three days in a state of feverish suspense. Would Felice Fogg, whom they had forgotten, reappear before their eyes? Where was he at this moment? The 17th of December, the day of James Strand's arrest, was the 76th since Felice Fogg's departure, and no news of him had been received. Was he dead? Had he abandoned the effort, or was he continuing his journey along the route agreed upon? And would he appear on Saturday, the 21st of December, at a quarter before nine in the evening, on the threshold of the Reform Club saloon? The anxiety in which, 
for three days, London society existed, cannot be described. Telegrams were sent to America and Asia for news of Philly's fog. Messengers were dispatched to the house in Savile Row morning and evening. No news. The police were ignorant what had become of the detective, Fix, who had so unfortunately followed up a false scent. Bets increased, nevertheless, in number and value. Fully's fog, like a racehorse, was drawn near his last turning point. The bonds were quoted, no longer at a hundred below par, but at twenty, at ten, and at five. And paralytic old Lord Albemarle bet even in his favour. A great crowd was collected in Pall Mall and the neighbouring streets on Saturday evening. It seemed like a multitude of brokers permanently established around the Reform Club. Circulation was impeded, and everywhere disputes, discussions, and financial transactions were going on. The police had great difficulty in keeping back the crowd, and as the hour when police fog was due approached, the excitement rose to its highest pitch. The five antagonists of Felice Fogg had met in the great saloon of the club. John Sullivan and Samuel Follington, the bankers, Andrew Stewart, the engineer, Gauthier Ralph, the director of the Bank of England, and Thomas Flanagan, the brewer, one and all waited anxiously. When the clock indicated twenty minutes past eight, Andrew Stewart got up, saying, Gentlemen, in twenty minutes the time agreed upon between Mr. Fogg and ourselves will have expired. What time did the last train arrive from Liverpool? Asked Thomas Flanagan. At 23 minutes past 7, replied Gauthier Ralph. And the next does. Not arrive till 10 minutes after 12. Well, gentlemen, resumed Andrew Stewart, if Phillies Fogg had come in the 7.23 train, he would have got here by this time. We can, therefore, regard the bet as won. Wait. Don't let us be too hasty, replied Samuel Follington. You know that Mr. Fogg is very eccentric. His punctuality is well known. He never arrives too soon, or too late. And I should not be surprised if he appeared before us at the last minute. Why, said Andrew Stewart nervously, if I should see him, I should not believe it was he. The fact is, resumed Thomas Flanagan, Mr. Fogg's project was absurdly foolish. Whatever his punctuality, he could not prevent the delays which were certain to occur. And a delay of only two or three days would be fatal to his tour. Observe, too, added John Sullivan, that we have received no intelligence from him, though there are telegraphic lines all along his route. He has lost, gentleman, said Andrew Stewart, he has a hundred times lost. You know, besides, that the China the only steamer he could have taken from New York to get here in time arrived yesterday. I have seen a list of the passengers, and the name of Felice Fogg is not among them. Even if we admit that fortune has favoured him, he can scarcely have reached America. I think he will be at least twenty days behind hand, and that Lord Albemarle will lose a cool five thousand. It is clear, replied Gauthier Ralph. And we have nothing to do but to present Mr. Fogg's cheque at Bearings tomorrow. At this moment, the hands of the club clock pointed to twenty minutes to nine. Five minutes more, said Andrew Stewart. The five gentlemen looked at each other. Their anxiety was becoming intense. But, not wishing to betray it, they readily assented to Mr. Follington's proposal of a rubber. I wouldn't give up my four thousand of the bet, said Andrew Stewart, as he took his seat, for three thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine. The clock indicated eighteen minutes to nine. The players took up their cards, but could not keep their eyes off the clock. Certainly, however secure they felt, minutes had never seemed so long to them. Seventeen minutes to nine, said Thomas Flanagan, as he cut the cards which Ralph handed to him. Then there was a moment of silence. The great saloon was perfectly quiet. But the murmurs of the crowd outside were heard, with now and then a shrill cry. The pendulum beat the seconds, which each player eagerly counted, as he listened, with mathematical regularity. Sixteen minutes to nine, said John Sullivan, in a voice which betrayed his emotion. One minute more, and the wager would be won. 
Andrew Stewart and his partner suspended their game. They left their cards and counted the seconds. At the 40th second, nothing. At the 50th, still nothing. At the 55th, a loud cry was heard in the street, followed by applause, hurrahs, and some fierce growls. The players rose from their seats. Here I am, gentlemen. At the 57th second the door of the saloon opened. And the pendulum had not beat the 60th second when Felice Fogg appeared, followed by an excited crowd who had forced their way through the club doors, and in his calm voice, said, Here I am, gentlemen. Chapter 37 in which it is shown that Felice Fogg gained nothing by his tour around the world, unless it were happiness yes. Felice Fogg in person The reader will remember that at 5 minutes past 8 in the evening, about 5 and 20 hours after the arrival of the travellers in London, Passapartout had been sent by his master to engage the services of the Reverend Samuel Wilson in a certain marriage ceremony, which was to take place the next day. With his hair in disorder, and without his hat, he ran. Passapartout went on his errand enchanted. He soon reached the clergyman's house, but found him not at home. Passapartout waited a good twenty minutes, and when he left the reverend gentleman, it was thirty-five minutes past eight. But in what a state he was! With his hair in disorder, and without his hat, he ran along the street as never man was seen to run before, overturning passersby, rushing over the sidewalk like a water spout. In three minutes he was in Savile row again, and staggered back into Mr. Fogg's room. He could not speak. What is the matter? asked Mr. Fogg. My master! gasped Passapart out, marriage, impossible, impossible. Impossible, for tomorrow. Why so? Because tomorrow is Sunday. Monday, replied Mr. Fogg. No, today is Saturday. Saturday. Impossible. Yes, 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 yes cried Passapart out. You have made a mistake of one day. We arrive twenty-four hours ahead of time. But there are only ten minutes left. Passapart out had seized his master by the collar and was dragging him along with irresistible force. Felice Fogg, thus kidnapped, without having time to think, left his house, jumped into a cab, promised a hundred pounds to the cabman, and, having run over two dogs and overturned five carriages, reached the reform club. The clock indicated a quarter before nine when he appeared in the great saloon. Felice Fogg had accomplished the journey round the world in eighty days. Felice Fogg had won his wager of twenty thousand pounds. How was it that a man so exact and fastidious could have made this error of a day? How came he to think that he had arrived in London on Saturday, the twenty-first day of December, when it was Really Friday, the 20th, the 17th day only from his departure. The cause of the error is very simple. Felice Fogg had, without suspecting it, gained one day on his journey, and this merely because he had travelled constantly eastward. He would, on the contrary, have lost a day had he gone in the opposite direction, that is, westward. In journeying eastward he had gone towards the sun, and the days therefore diminished for him as many times four minutes as he crossed degrees in this direction. There are 360 degrees on the circumference of the earth. And these 360 degrees, multiplied by four minutes, gives precisely 24 hours, that is, the day unconsciously gained. In other words, while Felice Fogg, going eastward, saw the sun pass the meridian 80 times, his friends in London only saw it pass the meridian 79 times. This is why they awaited him at the Reform Club on Saturday, and not Sunday, as Mr. Fogg thought. And Passapartout's famous family watch, which had always kept London time, would have betrayed this fact, if it had marked the days as well as the hours and the minutes. Felice Fogg, then, had won the £20,000. But, as he had spent nearly 19,000 on the way, the pecuniary gain was small. His object was, however, to be victorious, and not to win money. He divided the 1,000 pounds that remained between Passapart out and the unfortunate fix, against whom he cherished no grudge. He deducted, however, from Passapart out's share the cost of the gas which had burned 200. 
in his room for 1920 hours for the sake of regularity that evening mr fogg as tranquil and phlegmatic as ever said to order is our marriage still agreeable to you mr fogg replied she it is for me to ask that question you were ruined but now you are rich again pardon me madam my fortune belongs to you if you had not suggested our marriage my servant would not have gone to the reverend samuel wilson's i should not have been apprised of my error and dear mr fogg said the young woman dear roda replied phileas fogg it need not be said that the marriage took place 48 hours after and that passapart out glowing and dazzling gave the bride away had he not saved her and was he not entitled to the honor the next day as soon as it was light passapart out rapped vigorously at his master's door mr fogg opened it and asked what's the matter passapart out what is it sir why i've just this instant found out hat that we might have made the tour of the world in only 78 days no doubt returned mr fogg by not crossing india but if i had not crossed india i should not have saved orda she would not have been my wife and mr fogg quietly shut the door felice fogg had won his wager and had made his journey around the world in 80 days to do this he had employed every means of conveyance steamers railways carriages yachts trading vessels sledges elephants the eccentric gentleman had throughout displayed all his marvelous qualities of coolness and exactitude but what then what had he really gained by all this trouble what had he brought back from this long and weary journey nothing say you perhaps so nothing but a charming woman who strange as it may appear made him the happiest of men truly would you not for less than that make the tour around the world